Hello, I'm Barry Edelstein, Erna Fincy Viterbi, Artistic Director of the Old Globe in San Diego, California. And I'm delighted to welcome you to part two of our new series, Thinking Shakespeare Live, Infinite Book. We started this series, oh, a couple weeks ago as we have continued our work in the pandemic. The Old Globe believes that theater matters and our commitment is to make it matter to more people. Since our three gorgeous auditoria in the middle of beautiful Balboa Park have been closed now for over a year, we have pivoted our work to digital platforms because the theater's superpower is to bring together a group of strangers and forge them into one audience, into a community. And if we can't do that in person, we've been able to do it in electronic virtual forms. And it's been very, very powerful for all of us involved at the Old Globe to be able to reach out through the internet and continue our work of making theater matter. One of the big steps in our, in our pandemic theater mattering is going to be this, a radio production of Shakespeare's Hamlet that will be broadcast in the month of April by our partners at KPBS, the NPR affiliate here in San Diego. We've assembled the company from our 2017 production at the Lowell Davies Festival stage in the middle of Balboa Park, including the brilliant Grantham Coleman in the title role. And uh, we're really, really delighted to be able to bring that extraordinary, beautiful play of Shakespeare to a big new audience in this form. Now, when I got to work on that Hamlet, a little while ago, I dug back into my files for my script from 2017, and I uh, opened up my word processor, did some work on it, printed out a brand new version here in my trusty Edelstein office furniture, Lucky Binder. My, my dad, may he rest in peace, that was his company, and I keep this with me whenever I direct a play. And there is the title page, Hamlet on the Radio, in nice, crisp, laser-printed type. And it got me thinking, you know, gee, how, how does that work? You know, that I, I went to the internet and I downloaded a script three years ago. I word processed it. I did some more work on it. I pressed print on my keyboard, out it spat. So I went to one of those, how does it work websites, right? To just figure out a laser printer. And you know, the laser beam fires into a prism and it hits a photosensitive drum and then that electrostatically attracts some toner, this, this weird powder to a piece of paper, and then a heating unit fuses the print to that piece of paper, and out it comes, and the path that the paper follows is a miracle. I remember a couple of years ago reading in the New Yorker magazine a story about the engineers whose job it is to figure out how to get a piece of paper to follow a path through a laser printer, and it's this like miracle of engineering to try and make one of these things work, and we just take it for granted and press print. And I thought, Shakespeare wrote this play in 1603. He wasn't able to do that. That's what he <laughs> looked like, right? A quill pen and a pot of ink and, wow, some, some open flame around. I mean, that's not really Shakespeare, needless to say, I, 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 an artist's impression of Shakespeare at work. But, wow, the, 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 the technology is uh, an incredibly long way from, from that, which is what he put out to something that looks more like, you know, that. And when I considered that extraordinary thing, that, that, that journey from Shakespeare's quill pen to my laser printer, I started asking myself this question. How did Shakespeare's plays travel 400 years from his quill pen to our stage. It's something I've thought a lot about in my 30 years in the world of Shakespeare, something I've paid some attention to, how books were created in Shakespeare's period, how they were transmitted over the course of four centuries to us today. And that's what gave rise to this program, this program that we call Thinking Shakespeare Live, Infinite Book. 
The program I'm uh, presenting in four parts. Last uh, two weeks ago, we did a part on the, the sort of uh, publishing business and the theater business in Shakespeare's period and how they interrelated and the various people who came together to move his plays into print during his lifetime. This week, we're going to talk about manufacturing the big book. And what book am I talking about? I'm talking about that book, the first folio of 1623. That's the first complete works of Shakespeare. Mr. William Shakespeare's comedies, histories, and tragedies printed in London in 1623. It's an extraordinary book. It's in many ways an infinite book because it brings together all 36 of Shakespeare's plays for the very, very first time. The first time all of his output was collected between two covers. And it's a book, needless to say, that has changed the course of world culture. As Shakespeare has come to us and influenced our language, influenced the way we think about each other, influenced art forms, influenced cultural movements around the world. It's a book that really is quite infinite. In nature's infinite book of secrecy, a little can I read, is a line in Antony and Cleopatra, one of his great masterpieces. And so I thought I'd come to all of you and look at this infinite book and see if together we could read some of its secrets. To do that, we need to turn back the clock to 1623 and understand that the world then is a little different than it is now, uh, in specifically in ways that have to do with ideas of art and intellectual property and copyright and the way in which a maker of a piece of literature related to his work as it moved through the publication process. So let me just briefly review some of the stuff that we talked about uh, last time. This is a period, Shakespeare's period, in which there's no uh, author's copyright. That didn't happen for another hundred years after Shakespeare's lifetime. And intellectual property rules worked a little differently than we think about them today. Today somebody writes something and they own it. And they own it until, I believe it's now 70 years after their death, their estate owns it until copyright finally expires. That wasn't an idea that was alive in Shakespeare's time. In Shakespeare's time, somebody would write something and then sell it and the new owner owned it and owned all the rights in it. So Shakespeare's theater worked like that. Writers were uh, contract workers. They, they wrote works for hire, sold them to the theater companies. The theater companies now owned them, and the writers had no further control. The theater companies could doctor them. They could change them. They could bring somebody else in to rewrite them. They could choose to produce them, or they could choose to not produce them. It was their property. They could do with it whatever they wanted. If a play proved popular, they could bring it back into the repertoire again. They could take it on tour. We know Shakespeare's theater company toured provincial towns in England. It toured to Europe. And for the very first time in Shakespeare's period, something new arose, which was a reading audience for plays. So the theater companies that had spent some money to buy a play from a writer would squeeze every drop out of it in terms of ticket sales at their theater, but then they could get more out of it when they sold it to a publisher who would print it up, try and sell copies at a profit. By this time, the playwright is two removes from his play. He sold it to the theater. The theater has now sold it to the publisher. Sometimes, if a play was a huge hit, it could be reprinted many, many times until the publisher thought, wow, that was a really, really great investment, me buying that play from that theater company and putting it into print. Now, Shakespeare had his own relationship with publishing outside his work as a writer. He first came to prominence as a poet in the early 1590s. He wrote these two epic poems, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece. They were published in 1593 and 1594, respectively. Uh, by 1609, you know, some, some years later, he was a huge star. Now his name is above the title and gigantic. There his sonnets were printed. So he had a relationship to publishing separate from his life as a playwright. And during his lifetime, this about 17 of his plays were printed some multiple times, including some real masterpieces. And they were printed in a flimsy format that's called quarto, which I'll talk about a little later, not meant to endure, the equivalent of a cheap paperback book today, where somebody, if they saw Hamlet, they could then go to the booksellers near St. Paul's Cathedral on the north bank of the Thames and buy it. And it would just be a, a thing that they could check out, really very quite ephemeral. 
But that left all of these Shakespeare plays that were not printed during his lifetime. Why? We're not entirely sure. Maybe they weren't big successes. Maybe there wasn't an appetite for it. Maybe there was a problem with the theater company in terms of their relationship with the printers. But here you see some giant Shakespeare plays that we can't imagine life without, as you'd like it. Julius Caesar, uh, Twelfth Night, uh, The Tempest, really giant. The Winter's Tale, my favorite Shakespeare play, wasn't printed during Shakespeare's lifetime. Now, uh, this partly was a quirk of popularity, a quirk of the theater business, the publishing business. But there's another interesting thing happening in the period, which is that plays were deemed sort of second-class literature. They weren't considered really serious enough to merit the huge investment of publishing, in particular in a really big book, which a, a larger format book, which were very, very expensive to produce. So publishing in large format, serious, bound, worthy, important sort of uh, works with gravity, that was reserved for scientific treatises, medical treatises, religious treatises, philosophical treatises, or works by aristocrats or, or royalty or something like that. But plays, that was considered riffraff. Remember, this is the, the, a Puritan period. The Puritans are going to come to power not too long after Shakespeare's death. They loathed the theater. Preachers in Puritan churches preached against the theater. There was an anti-theatrical prejudice broadly, and there was an anti-theatrical prejudice in the literary world. And that changed in a year that's very, very big in any study of Shakespeare and Renaissance drama, which is the year 1616. In that year, this guy, Ben Jonson, who was a writer and a poet and a contemporary of Shakespeare's and a man with a pretty healthy ego, gathered up all of his plays and printed them in a folio format, in a large print format, many, many hundreds of pages, a big expensive undertaking. And when he did that, he broke the taboo against printing plays in this very, very serious format. The last time I shared the anecdote about the Bodleian Library in Oxford, a, a depository library in England, a place where every book printed is deposited. When it was created in 1602, Thomas Bodley, whose library it was, said, I don't want plays in here. There's that anti-theatrical prejudice. Well, for 14 years later in 1616, Ben Jonson put paid to that, and he published Benjamin Jonson, his works in folio format, breaking through so that plays now could be printed in this way. Well, 1616 is the year that Shakespeare died. And so his friends in his theater company, the King's Men, decided to memorialize him by gathering up all of his plays and printing them in folio, 1616. And we owe them an enormous debt of gratitude. There's a list of names. John Hemmings and Henry Condell are the prime movers. Two actors in Shakespeare's company, Richard Burbage, the great star, played Hamlet, played Romeo, played Henry V, the big star of the period. They were the drivers behind this idea of gathering up all of Shakespeare's plays and printing them in folio. We see the brothers Herbert, who are the third and fourth earls of Pembroke, who are patrons of the arts. The Jaggards, uh, father and son, William and Isaac, publishers who, who printed the first folio. Edward Blunt, I'm sorry, printers. Blunt was the publisher. Jaggard ran the printing houses. Smethig and Aspley were investors. There was this coalition of folks who got together to create the first folio of Shakespeare. And there it is this amazing book that changed everything, this giant volume that changed the course of literary history. So there's a little review from last time, and now what I want to talk about today is the creation of the book, the making of the big book. So let's talk about how the 36 plays were gathered took a long time for this coalition of Shakespeare's friends, Hemings and Condell, to find all the plays. 17 of them were already in print. So these guys had to run around London to the various rights holders, publishers who published the plays. Maybe they weren't even in business anymore. Some of these plays were printed in the early 1590s, and it's now 1617, 1618, maybe 1619, as Hemings and Condell are running around London trying to gather back the publication rights for these plays of Shakespeare that had been sold. So they had a multi-year legal process of 
tracking down the rights for the plays that already had been published and gathering them up to bring over to Jaggard's print shop to be printed a second time. But they also had the problem of finding those other 18 plays that had never been printed during Shakespeare's lifetime, so they had to locate manuscripts. Now, there wasn't some neat filing system over at the theater down in the basement of the Old Globe. Maybe they could find a couple there. Maybe Shakespeare's own heirs had a couple of them, maybe up in Stratford in Shakespeare's house, maybe in the garret where Shakespeare lived in London. Maybe they had to run around to some actors. Maybe they themselves had to dig through some old file boxes to find their manuscripts from these other 18 plays when they were at the theater. It took a long time just to gather up the material for the, the, the plays, the 36 plays that were published. Now there's an example of Shakespeare's hand. I showed you a, a page of manuscript. Only one page of Shakespearean manuscript survives from a lost play called Sir Thomas More. Take a look at that. That's a, that's a famous, or I suppose for students of the period infamous, kind of writing that's called the Elizabethan secretary hand. That's the handwriting that people used to, to, to write stuff down in Shakespeare's period. You have to study this if you're gonna do any kind of archival research. It's extremely hard to decipher. There's Shakespeare's signatures, six signatures of Shakespeare survive on his will, on other legal documents, some real estate papers. He was a very litigious fellow, this Shakespeare, involved in some lawsuits during his lifetime against debtors and various other issues that he was involved in. And there you see a, you know, a sort of strangely unsteady, you know, wobbly looking hand. But that's it. That's, that's William Shakespeare's uh, signature. So people had to get together and figure out how to decipher this stuff and turn it into a copy that the printing house could make use of. An author's manuscript were called foul papers. You can see why they're kind of a mess they would be brought to the theater company and would be uh, written out in a clean transcription that's called a fair copy. Then the fair copy would be bound together in a prompt book or a script, just like, just like mine here. Here's my fair copy of Hamlet for a radio production. The actors, because they wanted to save on paper, didn't get the whole script. They only got their own lines in a little scroll. You'd get your own lines plus the cue line that came before you, and that's all you got. So really, there'd only be like one complete clean copy sitting around. That's why it was such a big uh, detective job to pull all these things together. We owe a thanks to Rafe Crane, who was the, the scribe at the theater company. He was the guy who, when the playwright handed in that messy manuscript in the Elizabethan secretary hand, he wrote it out cleanly for the theater company to use. Edward Knight was the prompter. He created all the scripts for the actors and for the theater company of the King's Men. So hat tip to... Uh, Crane and Knight for all that they did in helping gather all this extraordinary material for the first folio. So after the multi-year process of gathering these 36 plays, the next part was actually the physical manufacture of the book. And so uh, let's, let's take a look at what was involved in manufacturing this giant first folio. It's a big book, 900 pages. Each page has two columns of text. There are 67 lines in each column and nearly a million words. There's an example of just one page. There you see 67 lines of text in two columns of type. It's a 900 page book. There you get a sense of how hefty the thing is. That's a picture of yours truly with a copy of the first folio when the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington DC sent it out on a tour around the United States and we set up a beautiful exhibit at the San Diego Central Library that was about the history of Shakespeare at the Old Globe and in San Diego we're going to do a virtual version of that as part of the rollout of our Radio Hamlet. But there you see it's a big book about 17 inches tall, 900 pages pages. It's a, it's a big, big door stopper of a uh, big door stopper of a thing. Now, uh, the, the, the key person in all of this is somebody called a compositor. 
A compositor is what today we would call a typesetter, the person who sets up the page for the printing press. There you see a picture of a period compositor's desk, and in the upper left corner is a page of manuscript that the compositor is going to set up for printing. And uh, in his desk there, he's got a bunch of little cubbies that have little pieces of type. This is, this is Gutenberg technology, movable type from 1450, where you take little squares that have little carvings of, of letters and set them up, and then you smear some ink on it, press it down with a piece of paper. So the compositor is the typesetter. The compositor reaches in, takes these little bits. They're, they're either made of little wood carved things or maybe they're wood sticks with little metal carved letters on them and sets them up in a stick there and has to do it upside down and backwards. If you look real closely, you can see the, that says the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog upside down and backwards so that when you smear some ink on it, put a piece of paper down, when you pick the paper up, it will read properly right side up and from right to left. And every single letter of every single page, all one million words in the first folio has to be set up one letter at a time, upside down and backwards. You gather those little subsections that the compositor makes into a page that's called a form, and then you take that form, smear some ink on it, press a piece of paper on it, and presto, you've got a page. Now remember, these pages are set up one letter at a time. There's a closer look at a compositor's desk and you can see these little cubbies in which all the different letters are organized. The small letters, which you need a lot of, are kept close to you, and the capital letters, which you need relatively less frequently, are kept farther away. That is, the small letters are stored in the lower case, and the capital letters are stored in the upper case. Ah, that's where those words come from. It has to do with compositor technology of movable type in starting in 1450. The, the big letters, the capital letters, are stored farther away in the uppercase. The small letters are stored closer in the lowercase, and that language has continued. Now, the compositor's job is not just about setting up all these letters upside down and backwards, but it's also about planning pages, and that's called casting off. Very, very important part of this work. You've got to figure out how much material you can get on each page and what stuff needs to be on each page of the book as you print it and assemble it. Today, that's all done by software, Adobe PageMaker or whatever. But in Shakespeare's period, it was somebody's job to actually plan out the book. And if you didn't do this right, you could really mess up. Now, the first folio is called a folio in sixes, and I'm going to use some props to show you what that means. The word folio, just to review, uh, comes from the way the paper is handled. You start with one sheet of paper called a broadsheet, about twice as big a, as this in Shakespeare's period. And if you fold it in half, you now have something that looks like a book with two pages and four sides. So you print two pages on this side, you print two pages on that side, you fold it up, then you take a bunch of these and put them together into what's called a choir, and then a bunch of choirs put together make a book. If you fold it one more time so that you now have four pages with eight sides, that's called quarto. So that's all quarto is, folio. Quarto is flimsier, smaller, not meant to endure. Folio was the format that was used for a, 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 a big, serious, important uh, book. So uh, again, four, four pages, quarto. You'd have to cut the page open in order to read it. You could go farther. You could make an octavo, which is eight pages with 16 sides. You could even make a decimo sexto book, which is 16 pages with 32 sides. And again, it's all about casting off planning in advance which page is going to go where so that as you fold it, it all follows in order as a book. The folio is a choir in sixes. It's, it's three sheets with two pages each put together. So here you have three sheets of paper, right? I've got one, two, three folded. So now you have pages one through twelve. And you open it up, page one, inside you have pages two and three, inside that you have pages four and five, etc. That's called a choir. In sixes, that's the format that the first folio used. Take a bunch of these and you'd sew them together in a book. Now, here's one of the tricks about that. If you take a look, I'm going to pull out the second of these three pages. 
And there you see that pages four and nine are on one side and pages 10 and three are on the other. So that means that before any work starts, somebody had to figure out, well, page three is gonna have to go on this side, page 10 and page nine are gonna have to be on the other side. It's a big, complicated job and one of the most important jobs that the compositor has. Sometimes they would have some extra space on a page. There's an open first folio and you can see that weird um, sort of illustration, that weird device that's on the left-hand page. There's a closer look. That's the last page of the play Measure for Measure. The text of the play ends on the top quarter of the page, but then there's three quarters of white space. The Jaggards hated white space. They filled it up. So in this case, they took the cast list of the play, right? When we buy a play today, we're used to seeing the cast list at the beginning. Shakespeare's plays, they would put it in at the end, but only if they had space and sometimes only to take up space. So there you see the, the characters in the play listed, the dramatis personae, and still there's half a page of white space. So they made this little device to take it up so that the book would feel full and that there wouldn't be empty pages around. There are the first pages from the first folio of The Winter's Tale and The Tempest. And again, the compositor in the casting off process figured out that he would need to start The Winter's Tale quite close to the top of the page in order for everything to fit, but The Tempest could start a little further down and therefore he'd have some room to fill up at the top. And so they use these decorative devices, bigger in The Tempest to take up more space than in The Winter's Tale. Even the title, The Tempest, Tempest ha happens on two lines. The Winter's Tale all happens on one line. This is all the art and science of manufacturing a book to be as efficient with your paper and get as much in, uh, in, in printing done uh, as, you, as you possibly can. Let's take a look inside a print shop in the period. Here's an engraving, a woodcut of a print shop from around 1605, and it really gives you an incredible sense of how the work actually got done. Remember, the writer's over there scratching away with his quill pen. There's a whole manufacturing process going on to make the thing into a physical book. There are three, five, eight, nine, ten folks sitting in this picture here. And, and let's take a little tour around the place to see what everybody does. Over on the left-hand side of the frame is the compositor's section. Here are the guys actually setting up the pages. Closest to the window where there's a lot of light, you have two guys sitting on a bench with their upper cases and their lower cases. They've got a piece of paper, a manuscript page up on their little stand, and they've got a supervisor maybe telling them, no, start that there, no, start that there. Hey, be very careful. Shakespeare's handwriting is a mess. You've got to pay really close attention. And these guys spend all day setting up these little uh, sticks, and then they're going to be turned into forms and handed over to the printer. Over here is another two set of compositors, but they seem to be a little bit more highly ranked. Take a look at that guy. He's got a cushion on his bench. The other guys didn't. He's got some fancier clothes than the other guys had. He's got a dagger. So maybe he's the guy who's the sort of head compositor in the shop setting up pages. There's a proofreader who's got glasses, right? He's been doing this a long time, man. The, you know, checking out all this movable type, that'll wear out your eyes, won't it? So there's a, there's a nice guy with glasses checking out to make sure everything's going okay. So those are the compositors setting up all the movable type ready to be printed. We move over to the mechanical side of the shop, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. There's a guy in the back coming in with a delivery of paper, right, on top of his head, big stack of paper. Next to him is a dude with these two weird balls with sticks. And then you can see in front of him what one looks like, and there's a little uh, jug of some kind. That's the inker. So these were leather balls filled with horse hair, and they would be soaked in ink, and then you'd spread the ink out on the form that the compositors had made, and then hand it to the pressman, and the pressman would press a piece of paper down on it. The ink was made of uh, oil, and you, something called lamp black gave it its black uh, tint, which was basically burned um, wick from lamps, right? The ash of burned uh, whatever was burning in an oil lamp uh, that would be then uh, treated somehow, and that would create the, the black tint for the ink. So there's this guy using these balls, these leather balls, to ink up the page. He then hands it to the beefiest guy in the shop, right? He's a big guy, and he's yanking this big lever, which is pressing the press down 
on the page and taking up the ink. The pages would be wet. You can see some pages hanging to dry behind that guy's head. And so this muscular fellow would yank and operate that printing press day in and day out. Near him, there's a child at work, an apprentice, a young kid who's working. He's just stacking up pages. But the interesting detail about this kid is what's behind him. You can see a little wheeled trough with uh, liquid in there. Now, uh, here's where, if any of you are eating while you're watching me, just put your fork down for a minute. It gets a little bit gross right now. That oily ink had to be cleaned off. So each time they finished printing a certain number of pages, they'd have to dismantle the form, give the little pieces of type back to the compositors so they could set up the next page to be printed. But they had to be cleaned first. They had to get the ink off. And the chemical that was used to clean the ink was ammonia. Well, what's the most plentiful and least expensive source of ammonia? I'm sorry to say urine. So in this print shop, there's a big trough of pee-pee sitting there that they're using to clean their stuff. I, I, I take the time to make this point because it's very important to understand the, the humanity of printing a book. These are humans doing this who have to pee and they're going to use their stuff to help the process along. Anytime we want to put Shakespeare on a pedestal, anytime we want to make Shakespeare into some kind of demigod, I always try and remember, yeah, but there's some folks working hard with bad eyesight in a shop where there's a big trough of some not very pleasant substance there. That's part of Shakespeare in the same way that what a piece of work is a man, how noble in faculty, how all of that, right? It's just the human part of what makes Shakespeare, Shakespeare. There's one last fellow in this shop. He's the boss, right? He's got a nice big belly. He's got money enough to eat well. And he's standing there supervising everybody. He doesn't look very happy. He's going, hey, 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 somebody open a window. It stinks in here, right? That's what, that's what the boss is saying. So there you see the entire printing operation of how a book was made in Shakespeare's period. Here's a, here's a painting, a Flemish painting of a print shop. It's a little nicer looking, some nice golden afternoon sunlight, right? They omit the cleaning trough from it, a little side by side. Like I remember once asking my son Augie where he'd rather work. And of course, he printed to the nice warm oil painting of uh, a, a, a beautiful print shop rather than the stinky uh, Elizabethan woodcut on the other side. It took uh, 287 sheets of paper per every copy of the first folio. That's a lot of paper that was used to manufacture this thing. Scholars are not sure, but we think that the print run was somewhere between 750 and 1,000 copies printed. That's 226,000 sheets of paper. The paper was all imported from France. There was no English paper making industry in Shakespeare's day. And apparently it was very high quality because there's a surviving sermon by a Puritan preacher railing at the fact that Shakespeare's plays were printed on better paper than the Bible was, right? How about that? So they used really good imported French paper. Today, France still makes amazing paper, right? Famous for its paper. So it was in Shakespeare's period. In order to manufacture that much stuff, the, the guy could run that lever about 250 times per hour, 250 pressings per hour. That's like uh, four pages a minute, one page every 15 seconds. So slap a page in there, ink, pull that lever, get some ink on that thing, slap another page in there, pull that lever, right? Four times a minute. It's a big manual heavy lift. Took a year to manufacture one copy of the first folio. One year to manufacture the first folio. Now, when you went to a bookstore in this period to buy a book, they weren't bound. You would buy unbound sheets of pages, loose leaves. And then you could walk to the bindery nearby where a book binder would put the thing in between leather and a nice good spine and sort of preserve it. 
but that's why so many folios have disappeared is that not all of them were bound. The bindery is a completely different process from the printing. That's also why title pages of books in this period are so fancy because this would have been what you saw on display. Today you go to a Barnes and Noble and you see some beautiful cover art on the uh, outer jacket of a book. Well, in Shakespeare's period, all you saw was the title page. There's the title page of uh, Johnson's works. You can see it's in incredible incredibly elaborate with, 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 with architecture and with mythological figures and with all sorts of extraordinary classical illusions going on. There's the famous title page of Shakespeare. That's what you would have seen on the shelf of the bookseller. You could then choose to go out and get your book bound if you wanted. The cheapest way to do it would be on the left, just some calfskin, right? Just unfinished calfskin, slap it around those pages. That would hold them together, protect them, you know, wrap the calfskin in some heavier stock, uh, glue it up to the book. On the right, there's calfskin that's been tanned, right? Darkened so that that will stay preserved a little bit longer. The next step up was to get really fancy, and we've all seen fame, you know, beautiful beautiful antique books that have pressed into the leather these beautiful designs that are then hand gold leafed. You can see the structure of the spine of the book there in the white area between those two pictures where that would actually give it enough uh, weight and, and, and structure to protect the book for a longer period of time. There's actually a bound first folio. There's a whole shelf of bound first folios from the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., where you can see the lengths to which people went to make sure that their folios were bound and protected between pages of leather. Unbound, a book cost about 15 shillings in 1623. That's actually pretty expensive, a couple hundred bucks to, to uh, in today's money-ish, hard to say exactly equivalently, uh, but you know, a very pretty expensive book to buy in Shakespeare's period, which is why they only printed 1,000 or 750, because there was no confidence that there was a much bigger market than that. Obviously, if you went and got it bound, it would cost even more than that. So 15 shillings in 1620, in October of last year, one of them sold for $10 million at auction. A, a college sold one, I guess, because it needed some money in the pandemic, and a, a private buyer uh, picked one up. There are about 235 first folios around, only six in private hands. A private collector spent ten million bucks in 2020 to pick one up. So that's how the first folio was manufactured. That's the technical process that goes into making a book in Shakespeare's period. Let's, let's now take a look at what's inside the first folio. You've already seen that title page. That's the famous uh, engraving of Shakespeare. Now, engraving technology for printing was different. This was some sort of uh, brass plate that would have been engraved by a sculptor. The sculptor's name was uh, Martin Druschout. Martin Druschout was a Flemish uh, artist who came to London, had a, had a career as a, 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 an engraver for printing. And this is his absolute most important piece of art, this famous engraving of Shakespeare on the front title page of the first folio of 1623. It's an odd piece. It's been deconstructed to within an inch of its life. If you look at it, Shakespeare's neck there would have to be about 10 inches long for it to make sense anatomically. His head is out of proportion to his body. Somebody's noticed that his left arm and right arm are the same, just simply flipped around. It's weird. His, his left arm's facing actually backward. Strange, weird hodgepodge of a drawing which has licensed a lot of conspiracy theories to say it's not a real guy. There are hints in here saying that, you know, if you, if you play the album backward, it will say Paul is dead, right? So there are strange uh, aspects to this, but that's, you know, what he looked like. And, and how do we know that? Because facing it opposite the title page is this little poem by Ben Jonson to the reader. It says, this figure that thou here seest put, the, the drawing, it was for gentle Shakespeare cut wherein the graver, the engraver, had a strife with nature to outdo the life. So Druschout fought with nature to do a better version of Shakespeare than life itself. Oh, could he have but drawn his wit as well in brass as he hath hit his face, the 
print would then surpass all that was ever writ in brass. So if only he'd been able to cap capture his imagination in the same way that he captured his face, then it would be the greatest brass carving ever made. But since he cannot read her, look, not on his picture, but on his book. So even Johnson was saying, listen, don't pay too much attention to this picture, right? So there's the to the reader poem that faces that incredibly famous drawing. Uh, some things to notice about printing in conventions in Shakespeare's period. U's and V's are interchangeable as they are in Latin. If you look in the middle, you see the word ever. Three lines up from the bottom, all that was ever written brass, E, U, E, R. So, you know, if you've been to Italy, you know that in Latin printing, V's and U's are interchangeable. There's a famous Mel Brooks joke, that, uh, where some movie that takes place in ancient Rome, and a guy goes, that guy's nuts, N-V-T-S, nuts. So U's and V's are interchangeable. There's no character for the letter J. I's are used for J, especially capital I's. So that's why you see the initials B-I there. That's actually a capital J. Ben Johnson wrote this poem. There's the two forms of S. So in the word Shakespeare, you see the first S is a, is a proper S, and then there's that weird long S shape that looks like an F, right? Same thing in the Declaration of Independence, Life, Liberty, and the Perfute of Happiness. Right? So there's just two forms of S. And that, that connects up to the English language's relationship to German. Uh, in Shakespeare's period, it, English was much closer to Middle English, which was, as you know, a, a form of German, related to German. And in contemporary modern German, there's the large S that looks like a B, right, in a word like Strasse. So you see that here. So if you look at the word surpass, um, just below the halfway point of this page, you see all those short, those, those S's that look like F's. Uh, we use and uh, abbreviations throughout the folio, a lot of ampersands instead of and, anything they could do to save some space, save some paper, which would make the manufacturing more efficient and less expensive. Ligatures are the connections of letters. So you see in ceased at, on the first line and picture on the bottom line, there's a little connecting figure. That's called a ligature. Uh, Shakespeare's language had different rules of capitalization than we have today. Most nouns are capitalized, again, a connection to German. In modern German, nouns are capitalized. So you see graver, nature, figure, print, reader, nouns that get capital letters as in German. And spelling is all over the place. Each compositor who worked on the folio spelled things in their own way. We're going to see more about that in a couple of weeks. But you see with nature to outdo the life spelled D-O-O. -O. So right here, on the title page of the folio, you see some of the weird quirks and idiosyncrasies of the way the English language worked in 1623. The next thing in the folio is a dedication, where Hemings and Condal, you can see their signatures on the right, dedicate this volume to the Earl of Pembroke and his brother, William and Philip Herbert, the third and fourth Earls of Pembroke. There they are, William and uh, Philip Herbert dashing looking fellows. They're the dedicatees. And Hemings and Condal say, we have but collected them and done an office to the dead to procure his orphans, guardians, without ambition, either of self-profit or fame, only to keep the memory of so worthy a friend and fellow alive as was our Shakespeare. So his plays are orphans now that their parent is dead. And Hemings and Condal put themselves forward as guardians who are going to protect them in order to keep the memory of Shakespeare alive. That's what they tell William and Philip Herbert, the Earl of the third and fourth Earl of Pembroke, about why they're doing this thing. The next thing in the folio is a table of contents. It's in three sections, comedies, histories, and tragedies. Each section, the page starts at one and goes to a couple hundred, 300, then goes back to one again. So it's like three volumes in uh, one. Interesting, some classifications, right? Measure for measure is there included in the comedies. The Tempest is included in the comedies. Scholars have been thrown for centuries about why certain plays have been classified as they are by Hemings and Condal, the editors of the folio. Also, the order. They didn't print them in chronological order. Why is The Tempest the first play? Was that their favorite play? Did they think maybe that was Shakespeare's favorite play? We don't know. Also missing here is Troilus and Cressida. 
Why? Because that play took a very long time to procure the rights. It had been printed, and the publisher who printed the earlier quarto version during Shakespeare's life apparently fought with Hemings and Condell about giving them the rights. So they went ahead and started manufacturing the book before they got the rights to Troilus and Cressida. That's why it doesn't show up in the title page. Actually, there are a handful of copies of the first folio where the play isn't there, and then the play pops in there because there was a legal dispute. And so they couldn't go ahead and print it until they got that resolved. The next thing is a nice tribute by Hemings and Condell to the company of the King's Men. And there's a list of all the actors who appeared in Shakespeare's plays from 1592-93 to 1616 when he died. Shakespeare and Burbage come first and second. Shakespeare acted in his plays. Burbage was the lead acting of the company, actor of the company. Hemings is next. Condell is another three or four down. You see all these names, the the first guy to play Touchstone, the first guy to play Iago, and the first boys who played Rosalind and Desdemona and Beatrice, right? There's the names of the actors in The King's Men, wonderful tribute in the first folio to all of those guys. Then there's a note to the reader. Hemings and Condell wrote another little letter here to the great variety of readers where they talk a little bit more about their friend, how he thought, how he wrote, and why they were doing this. In the middle of that letter they say, whatever you do, buy. So while it's true that they put this thing together as a memorial to their friend, as they told the Earls of Pembroke, it's also true that the theater company needed to make money. Why? Because in 1619, guess what happened? There was an outbreak of plague in London. Can you imagine a time when the plague would happen and a theater company would have to deal with it? It shut the globe down. It shut the globe down then, it shut the globe down now. They needed money. So that was one of the reasons for creating the first folio in the first place. They could sell these plays to a publisher and they could uh, maybe bring in a little bit of income for the King's Men Company while the plague was raging. They say in this to the great variety of readers uh, a little bit more about the publication history of Shakespeare's plays too. Before You were abused with divers stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that expose them. Even those are now offered to your view, cured and perfect of their limbs and all the rest, absolute in their numbers as he conceived them. So Hemings and Condell are saying, these are the official versions of the plays. And now 400 years later, we pretty much believe them. We mostly accept that the copies of the plays in the first folio are superior to the ones that had been printed during Shakespeare's lifetime, but not all the time. And I'm gonna talk about that in the next installment of Thinking Shakespeare Live, infinite book as well. So that's the first folio. That's what's inside it, the treasures that are inside this remarkable volume. But that's not all that's inside them. One of the extraordinary things about the book is not only does it preserve Shakespeare's plays, but it preserves some other really important things from Shakespeare's time, some trifles too. Take a look at that. Somebody left their glasses in the book in one copy of the folio while they were reading, and you can see the shape there of a a rusty pair of metal frame glasses left pressed in a page. Somebody, I don't know, fell asleep, their glasses fell into the book, they closed it. Where are my glasses? Well, they disappeared in the middle of this book and left an imprint in rust for future generations. There you see some rusty scissors that left their imprints in some copies of the first folio, right? That would have been at the bindery when the binder was using scissors to cut the leather that would go around the outside of the book and they misplaced their scissors and the outline of those scissors, the ghostly outline of those scissors have been preserved for posterity hundreds of years later when one of those folios was found in a bookshelf someplace. But what's also left behind in the pages of these books, and by the way, all sorts of other rare books, some going back hundreds and hundreds of years before the first folio, is human DNA. And librarians, rare book librarians that preserve these books, are worried not only about the humanities value, the literary value, the cultural value of the book, but also what the science can tell us. When somebody reads a book, they scratch their head, a hair falls into a page, maybe some dandruff falls into a page. 
Many people, when they read a book just like they do now, lick a finger before they turn a page. The saliva hits the paper and human DNA gets transferred to these pieces of paper from a long time ago. The DNA of the animal whose skin wrapped the book are being studied. And so these libraries are repositories for 400-year-old human history. And DNA scientists, geneticists, can, can extract DNA fragments from inside the pages of these books and find all things out about, about human health 400 years ago, about the human diet 400 years ago, about breeds of animals and where they were in Europe 400 years ago. And so there's a whole part to the first folio that goes beyond Shakespeare into a much more extraordinary study of human beings a very, very long time ago. It's one of the things I love the most about this when I talk to colleagues who do this work that these plays encode so many extraordinary things from years gone by. As I mentioned, there are about 235 surviving copies of the first folio. There have been two big censuses done, one about 100 or so years ago and another more recently by a scholar named Eric Rasmussen. If you got 400 bucks, you can go on Amazon and buy a census of the first folio that'll tell you where each copy is, who it belonged to, how it got bought, what kind of shape it's in. There's a rudimentary version of that census run by this Professor Rasmussen on the internet as well. The Folger Library in Washington, D.C. has 83 of them. There are about 18 in Japan, where there's a deep interest in Shakespeare, a bunch in England. As I mentioned, only six are in private hands. Some of the 235 copies of the folio are in not so great shape. There you see one that's missing all the front material and starts only with the Tempest. Some exist, uh, turn up randomly. There's a, there's a, a manor house in a place called the Isle of Butte off the coast of Scotland, where this first folio is found in three parts, the comedies, the histories, and the tragedies separately bound and unmarked. And it was discovered in 2010, a new copy of the first folio in some library in some random house on some random island off of Scotland, and nobody actually knew it was there till some librarian came in to make a catalog of the library and found this thing and said, oh my goodness, there's a first folio of Shakespeare here. More will be found in continental Europe, Probably not in the UK, most of those libraries have been found, but there are libraries all over Europe where a Shakespeare play might have migrated, France in particular, there were a bunch of them located there because there was so much traffic between England and France. And so more are sure to be discovered in the year ahead. Many, of course, have disappeared, but some more surely will turn up. There's some special ones. That's one of my favorite ones. That's a burned fragment of a first folio that was burned in a house fire. That's now in the library of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia under glass. And I, I had reason to be in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, and I went and did a pilgrimage, and I checked out that first folio. It belonged to this man, Edwin Forrest, the first great actor of the American stage and a great Philadelphian. He, he was famous for his work in Shakespeare, got his hands on a first folio. Folio. When he died, he willed it to a old age home for actors. He actually wonderfully called it the, the home for decayed actors. And he left his entire library to this place. And one day there was a terrible accident. The house caught fire. Most of his library burned. And his first folio ended up looking like that. Edwin Forrest, one of, the, one of the great treasures of the American theater. There are also some weird stories of shenanigans having to do with the first folio. Thefts, stolen copies, strange occurrences about this very valuable and important book. Uh, one of them happened here at the Chapin Library at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts in the Berkshires. That's the home of the famous Williamstown Theater Festival, where I've had the privilege of directing many times. They own a first folio. And in the 1940s, some group of criminals got together and decided that they were going to steal one. And one guy passed himself off as, a, as an English professor, wangled his way into the place, managed to convince somebody to let him look at the folio, and he ran out with it, ran to Albany, Albany to Buffalo, and there was this whole manhunt that went on trying to track down the Chapin Library Williams College folio. 
they found it, the police did, when one of the accomplices to this guy suddenly had the idea, got the idea, that the, the, the ringleader hated America and was going to give the first folio to Adolf Hitler, which would allow Hitler to then sell it and raise money for the war effort and help defeat the United States. So in an act of extraordinary patriotism, this guy turned himself and his colleagues in as the guys who stole the first folio at the Chapin Library. I've often thought that would make a, a great subject for a, a, a play one of these days. Maybe the Old Globe will do the, the story of the Chapin Library folio theft. There's one last piece of the folio that I want to conclude with today, a piece of the front matter that I skipped when I went through a survey of it earlier today, and it really uh, is an inspiration to me, I think to others who study and love Shakespeare, and provides me a, a great place to conclude uh, this episode of Thinking Shakespeare Live Infinite Book. And there it is, it's, um, it's a poem written by Ben Johnson, called To the Memory of My Beloved, the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and What He Hath Left Us. It's a poem in which Johnson expresses his love for his late friend, his admiration for his achievement, and uh, I find it very inspiring. I'm gonna read just a few excerpts of it to you uh, because I find it lovely and quite moving. Soul of the Age. The applause delight the wonder of our stage. My Shakespeare, rise! I will not lodge thee by Chaucer or Spencer or bid Beaumont lie a little further to make thee a room. Thou art a monument without a tomb and art alive still while thy book doth live. And we have wits to read and praise to give. Triumph, my Britain! Thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of Europe homage owe. He was not of an age, but for all time. But stay, I see thee in the hemisphere, advanced and made a constellation there. Shine forth, thou star of poets, and with rage or influence chide or cheer the drooping stage, which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night and despairs day, but for thy volumes light. There's that volume, the first folio, Shakespeare's infinite book, and it does shed a lot of light. It has shed light for me throughout my career in theater and indeed through this pandemic, and I hope I've been able to shed a little light on it for you. I'll be back in two weeks on April 1st with the third installment of Thinking Shakespeare Live Infinite book that I call One Play, Many Versions, where we'll talk about the fact that the folio sometimes duplicates a play that had already been printed during Shakespeare's lifetime and how we reconcile the differences between those two texts. You can check out something like 250 hours of online programming at the Old Globe's web website, www.theoldglobe.org. Not just my series on the sonnets, but stuff about how to write a play and how to make theater and stuff about poetry and the spoken word and just an immense outpouring of extraordinary programming that the Old Globe staff has been doing. There's going to be more uh, as our Hamlet on the radio show gets ready, interviews and a celebration of Shakespeare's birthday in a book club where you can read Hamlet. And if you enjoy that work and if you'd enjoyed uh, tonight's program, then I invite you to please go to the Globe Rising page of uh, our website and maybe consider a contribution, however big, however small, to help the Old Globe get through to that happy day when we can reopen, which maybe, maybe looks like it's coming soon. So thank you very much for being with me again tonight. Thanks to Elaine and Dave Darwin for their support of this program. It's a pleasure to share my love for Shakespeare, for the first folio, and for what these plays have meant to me with all of you. Don't panic, be brave, take care of yourself, take care of each other. Thanks a lot. 
くない。